This is Josh Nipple from Integrating Presence, and today I have with me uh, guest Christy Geltz. Christy's a good friend of mine, along with her husband, Robbie. I originally approached her on a topic that we're not going to do today, but Christy came back with another topic today, and that's about conscious pregnancies. Of course, that goes along with births and expecting mothers and fathers. Obviously, when she came back with that topic, I was wary at first. Still a little bit too, because, you know, I'm single and childless and you heard me right, ladies, single. Yeah, single. <laughs> Maybe this is too much, too much information, but for me, you know, it was never really a thing that I was, that I wanted or didn't want. It was kind of dependent on circumstances and partners. So yeah, definitely not for or against. So I thought this would be totally out of my comfort zone talking about something like this. So I, I, I jumped on the chance to do this because when I can get out of my comfort zone, that's how I learn and grow. So with that said, Christy, how's it going? Good. <laughs> I'm going to sit back in the chair a little bit here. And if you want to um, just tell people, you know, who you are, maybe a brief bio. Okay. Um, so my background, I grew up in the St. Louis area went to school in Rolla, Missouri for engineering, did chemical engineering, very much in the science um, engineering side of uh, life that all interested me. And then after I graduated, I worked a lot in the oil and gas industry um, for various companies. And then um, went through a really big breakup, actually, which kind of got me thinking more about the spiritual side of things and kind of catapulted my journey inward, then uh, continued working in the, um, as in engineering until my son was born. And then when he was born, it was too hard to watch someone else care for him. So I, I was convinced I was going to go back to work, but it was just too hard to do. So then quit my job and became a stay-at-home mom and have had an, a daughter since then, so I have two kids, and now I'm um, their primary caregiver. I also do uh, commercial, well, I do uh, renovations with my husband. He's in commercial real estate, so we do property management and that sort of stuff as our income. Well, cool. So I guess how do we dip our toes into this topic of conscious um, pregnancies, yeah. you know, because... Well, I mean, it's been a topic since time in memorial, right? Yeah. About planned pregnancies, unplanned pregnancies, conscious pregnancies. I mean, it can go deep into the spiritual aspects of this. And uh, as a little uh, foreshadowing, maybe towards the end, I'll I'll share something, you know, maybe more on the metaphysical end that, that I recently learned about that's kind of controversial surrounding this. But let's talk about just everyday life where we're at now in the current day and age and what maybe let's just start with what what is one of the biggest things that would maybe about what would constitute a conscious pregnancy and unconscious pregnancy uh maybe that whole spectrum even yeah, yeah and then i even kind of question using the word conscious um the the title because i'm not you know how conscious is it really but to me i felt where i went from what I felt from unconscious to conscious was when I was really following my own tuition and recognizing the basically just intuitive knowledge and power that flows through the mother um, from pregnancy through the birth. There's um, compared to like my daily life when you're pregnant, there is so much more happening. So it's much harder to um, ignore your intuition even you take it like basic food cravings. So like women who are pregnant, um, you know, you hear about it all the time. They want to eat things, certain things and other things are, you know, make them actually throw up. So um, it's your body's talking to you. You have a lot of gut feelings. Um, you, you know, it's just this huge like 
purge almost too with like the morning sickness and um, all the hormonal changes. And if you're not respecting your body, um, respecting those messages, it can make the process very difficult. And so I really struggled with that with my son. Um, there was a lot of squirrel just fell out of the tree <laughs> there was uh I was really resisting so I'm working my job thinking you know um probably not letting the divine feminine take over very much go 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 and it's like wait I need to like take a nap in the middle of the day I'm working you know I have this job how am I supposed to go and like take a nap in the middle of the day um and I was sick so most women or some women have morning sickness for like the first three months well I was sick the entire nine months with my son. So it was again that like, um, eventually I got to a point where I did honor it, where it's like, okay, I'm just going to take a nap. I'm going to put my away sign on my, um, you know, uh, profile and then I'm just going to take a nap and that's going to be that. Um, so yeah, I think that to summarize, I think it's just, you know, following your intuition and giving yourself what you need. And for guys, you hear this thing about sympathy weight, right? So they will put on uh, extra weight. As, yeah, sympathy weight during pregnancy. Yeah. And I can see that being like just with the women's cravings. I remember there was a phase where I was like obsessed with chicken wings. And so we were going to Buffalo Wild Wings like all the time. I wanted to eat there all the time, which my husband was like, oh, this is awesome. Um, and we would eat there like constantly. And then one day I went there and I'm like, I'm done with it. And then I don't like it was like years since we went back. But it's just, you know. The, the phases, the cravings. I hear so like they just, yeah, they get these weird cravings out of the blue that they wouldn't normally yeah. eat things too. Yeah, even weird, even weirder stuff than that too. But yeah, yeah. So, so what about um, birth options and all the different options yeah. for? Um, you know, obviously, most people are familiar with having a birth in the hospital, and maybe the. Um, what is it? The gone with the wind saying my, my aunt always says, uh, we don't know nothing about birth and no babies. You know? So, <laughs> yeah. but then you hear about birth doulas and underwater births and, you know, um, what are the, the, uh, a mid midwife midwifery and all this stuff gets very complex or can be, I guess, with laws and rules and regulations yeah. and backup plans and all this stuff. So if you want to share some of your experience and knowledge with that. Yeah. So I'll just give a high level what I did for both my children. We did um, home births, uh, which is a very small percentage of women in the U.S. Uh, do that. But I did a home birth with a midwife. There were actually a few midwives there um, and a doula. So, and it was in water. So I did a water birth. I had a blow up tub in the uh, bedroom, but so that was what I did. Um, how I got there was, um, so when I was still in Chicago working, I was researching this a lot and there's some documentaries out there. I won't name the one that's most famous, but it's very controversial, or controversial, brings forward a lot of um, information about drugs that are given to mothers especially like in the birth process and different procedures that can be performed whether you're um you know aware of it or not and again this might be all just horror stories but i was aware of that and very concerned with that kind of stuff so i started my first thing i looked for was a midwife and there are a lot of more and more practices are now they're having the doctor and then they also have a midwife um, but when i went the place I went to, um, we had moved to St. Louis. Well, actually before that I had a miscarriage, um, in Chicago, which for me, I took that as a sign, um, for me to evaluate my life and where it was going because I considered miscarriage having to do with the second chakra. This is just my experience for me. Um, and I looked at where my life was going, what I was creating, and I was then feeling the call to move to St. Louis, but I had not done that just, you know, resisting. Um, but after the miscarriage, and I said, okay, we're moving to St. Louis, and it all worked out beautifully. we got to keep our jobs, work remotely. So when we get to St. Louis, I look for um, midwives, and there's actually this really great facility um, in the area in O'Fallon, Missouri, where it's a group of midwives. They, it's a birth center, so it's separate from a hospital. Some hospitals have birth centers attached, um, but this was a standalone facility, and they also offered home births assuming you meet certain criteria health-wise and, um, you know, the 
pregnancy. It's going as planned. So I was really excited and I was so nervous. I remember going in there just feeling so nervous. Like, is this going to be the spot? And then once I got in, I just felt like this calm come over me. I felt like I was at the right place. And just working with the midwife, you know, you go into the office and there's like couches and it's very, just very cozy. It's not like sterile. It's, um, I just felt really good there. And then working with the midwife, they gave me just so much information on like doulas. And I remember with the doula, it was like, well, um, do I really need one? I'm not sure. But that's one thing, like, I'm so glad I did it because... <laughs> For me, I don't, I know that word. I don't actually know what it means. So if you would just tell me or just okay. you know, real briefly what a doula is. You know. Yeah. So I mean, and a midwife too. So midwife, <laughs> I mean, they do go to school. Okay. Um, they are, you know, trained. Um, and the, so, so they do have like a license to, you know, be, to facilitate um, births and do other women um, healthcare. So the best midwife, the doulas, um, not sure what certification is necessary, um, but it's more, I would say to me, she was like my helper. So she was always by my side. If I was um, wanting anything, she would be there. But also the doula, I feel at least when I use, cause, I mean, she, they attend so many births, so like they get the hang of it. Um, she was really good at just knowing what my body needed. Like, in certain movements where she'd push on my hips when I was like having contractions. And like, we go to, I remember going to, a, we would go to all these classes, you know, me and Robbie were going to all these classes to learn and what's the husband's role. And I think I had this uh, fantasy of, Oh, him being so like, you know, he's going to be my great helper. And in the moment he's going to know exactly what to do. And he, you know, is learning how to push on my hips and do all this kind of stuff. But in the moment, like I remember when, uh, the doula did it for the first time and she pushed on my hips and it was like, she was pushing so hard. Like there's no way Robbie would have known like how to do it and when to do it and at what force, but like she did it perfectly. So, um, and when we were doing the home birth, like there was just so much, so many things pulling Robbie, like, well, we got to get filling up the tub. We need more towels. We need this. And so Robbie's out running around doing all that stuff, taking care of people. And so she was just by my side giving me the support I needed. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, to answer your question, I guess. Oh, very cool. Okay. So, so I guess looping back to where, before I broke in there, um, but I guess you covered pretty much of it, right? I mean, that was, uh, so home birth. Yeah. That's, it's, um, it's, I guess what, what do you think turns more women off to, to that idea in the mainstream? Mm -hmm. And then what yeah. is kind of the appeal? You mentioned a lot of the appeal, but why don't you think it has more mainstream appeal other than kind of the obvious? Well, actually, it can state the obvious too. So Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and when I was telling people I was doing a home birth, you know, I got to meet all the resistance there. I think that a lot of people feel it's not safe. Um, there are, there's also, um, you know, maybe some doctors may think it's not safe, that birth is not a natural process and maybe it needs to be um monitored and i'm not against you know any of that stuff and i feel like it's every woman needs to choose what they want and the most important thing uh, which again is following your intuition i read that the safest and fastest births are those when the mother feels in control so if the mother is going to feel in control at a hospital on a hospital bed then you go for it like go do that go be safe go be where you need to be for me I felt the most, and the control part was the biggest thing for me because I wanted control over like, I want my baby on me. I want to see, like, I want to, I don't want an IV in my arm. I don't, I want to be in control. Like, So I felt, well, where am I going to be most in control? And that's going to be in my house. Um, the other thing I noticed I had to clear in my family, and I feel that women, um, some women carry this, that um, women not being able to do it just not being so when I decided to do a home birth and I told my mother and my mother's mom found out my grandmother they were actually the two that were most resistant they kept calling me telling me like well, what if your baby dies what if the cords around the neck what if all this stuff there was just so much fear um they were also like are you sure you're going to be able to do this and I'm like these women have had babies before but it's just this mindset of a woman not being strong enough and not being capable to birth a baby, which is what we're made for. So 
Um, for me personally, I knew I had to do it because of just the karma. I feel I was healing from my maternal line. Um, I think there's, when I was mentioning it to other people, um, I met one person who said like, oh, I'd love to do it, but I'm not sure if I'm brave enough. Um, so there's just a lot, I think, with going back to, um, you know, checking in with yourself, but again, being mindful of where you feel the safest and where you feel most in control, because that's likely the best option for you. This is interesting because there's so many other um, spiritual modalities around birth, right? There's a, um, I'm not really familiar with this, but I met a, a breathwork practitioner that does rebirthing breathwork, and I'm not really familiar with that at all. I know there can be um, birth trauma, uh, a lot of birth trauma. You know, for me, this is the exact, uh, not the exact opposite, but an opposite of when I was told about my birth, it was that I was a cesarean section mm -hmm. and that my mom was in labor for, I don't know how long. And she was, um, you know, <laughs> was supposed to be born on Christmas day, I think, but they're like, you're not having a Christmas baby. And so it went, it drug on and on and on. So finally, I guess, and then they, I was just looking at my birth, um, receipt. My parents kept that. And supposedly they took me and did all kinds of lab tests and, they don't know what they, I mean, how would I know what they've done, what they did with me when I was born like that? You know, I won't go into kind of like maybe the spiritual trauma around that as well. But that's a good mm -hmm. point. Um, that was one of my concerns because um, I wanted it to be where, you know, my baby wasn't leaving my sight and the most, the, the midwives I worked with were just really great at saying when the baby's born, you know, they would even walk through that. So when the baby which, and I did a, a water birth. So um, for expecting moms out there, if you can consider a water birth, there is something really wonderful. I had heard like a water births are great and like the water. And I remember when I was started having my contractions, I just got in the shower and there really is something with water. And I remember both births, I kept like yelling at my husband, like, is the tub full yet? Um, Cause I was just so ready to get in. And when you get in, it is just like, it's not going to take away everything. You're still, you know, in the middle of a birth, but um, there is just something really nice and calming about being in the water. It also helps. Um, uh, there's less risk of tearing if you're in the water. So um, just, you know, there's benefits for doing it, making it easier. And then they say it's an easier transition. So when the, and some people say, Oh, well, what if the baby's going to drown? Well, the baby does not start breathing until like a few minutes after it's born. So if it's born into water, they say it's a more easy transition for the child into this world, going from in the womb, then into water, warm water. And then, then I would pick up the baby and then the baby goes on the mother's chest and that's where the baby stays. Um, or, you know, they act, the midwife said you should be skin to skin with your child for at least 24 hours, which it's funny because with my son, I'm like following all the rules. So, okay, they say 24 hours. So I'm making sure I do at least 24 hours of him skin to skin with me. But with my daughter, my second birth, it was like, I think we were like skin to skin for like three days. But like, it just felt right. Like I was just, you know, we're, yeah, we're both just like, I mean, naked and not naked completely, but you know, she's naked on me. And it's just, there's just something really um, wonderful about that, that uh, I think is natural for women to do. It's just where our, our initial thought is to do more like, well, what's normal and normal is to be dressed with my child. And, you know, you see pictures of newborns with all these pretty little outfits on and stuff like that, which nothing against newborn pictures. Um, but there is something really special about just putting your baby on you and wrapping up in a blanket and just staying there and sleeping like that. And um, we co-slept, which is another controversial topic. Um, but it's just honoring that, um, you know, informing that bond. And it's so beautiful, like just the connection. And even now I feel like I have that connection just, um, with my children. Um, you know, you, they say that it's good to, to sleep with your child. Cause as you breathe out that your exhale, the breath on them triggers them to breathe. So there's that concern of the child stop breathing and they feel your heartbeat and you feel their heartbeat. And they say like your sinks, your sleep cycles sync up and, I feel it's so true. Like, it's almost like you feel you get in such a groove where you feel like you fall asleep at the exact moment together and you wake up at the exact moment together and your needs are, it's just, it's such a wonderful time for the mother and child to bond. Well, it seems like that's, it's, it's 
well, the first sign should be with the kids always wanting to run in with their parents anyway. The, the mm-hmm. kids that are the parents that don't do that, right? They're always wanting to go in there anyway, you know? So I, instead of fighting that, I mean, maybe that's, if that would happen, I would think, well, maybe it's time to, to look at, to inquire, well, why is that? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know, really know one way or the other, obviously, because I don't have children. But niece and nephew, you know, I can give them more of my attention now since, um, you know, since they don't require all of my time. Yeah. <laughs> but now did you, um, how long did you leave the umbilical cord attached? Cause I hear that's supposed to stay attached yeah. for a while. I mean, that's what some of the, um, teachers I follow recommend. So it actually stayed attached. So, I mean, they say if you're that, that's another thing that can cause trauma. Mm-hmm. If the baby comes out and you cut it because that's where they're getting all their oxygen, um, everything. So, I mean, you can wait until, I'm not sure how, you know, a few minutes or what, like the medical procedure would say, um, to do that. But when I did my home birth, um, you know, the baby came on me, umbilical cord still attached, I'm in the water. And then I, the placenta was birthed and then, then it was cut. So, I mean, the placenta is out of my body, the baby, it's still attached to the baby, but obviously it's still not getting any nutrients. So that's one way to be sure. Um, and then another I don't know, controversial, maybe not mainstream would be, uh, eating your placenta. I've heard this. Um, Yeah. Yep. So I actually had mine. I did not, some people can eat it and fry it up or I don't know what they do with it. They make it and then eat it. Um, I had mine encapsulated. Um, so they, I think they dry freeze it. Um, again, when I was working with midwives, they just had all these resources like, Oh, well, if you want to do this with your placenta, here you go. And so I had it in, Honestly, it was like, that's the one thing I would like, probably recommend to like every mother because those little pills are amazing. They say they help with recovery. They help with breast milk production. Um, my doula, oh God, hers done. And she said they gave her energy. Um, for me, I felt like it was like anti-depression pills. So we can get into that, like the postpartum depression. Um, but they're just really amazing little, little pills. So the placenta is very, uh, a very great organ that, um, and most, uh, mammals, I think all mammals beside camels, actually the mothers will eat their, the moms will eat their placentas. And I, I remember seeing, uh, uh my, my dad helped out with a veterinarian, uh, for part of his life and, uh, he neighbors, we lived out in the rural area and he would always go, they called him up, you know, when there was a mm-hmm. trouble with a, a birth or whatever. So I, I got to see some of those at a very young age. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess why not? Why don't we go into, yeah, other things surrounding pregnancy and the birth, not just necessarily those two things, but things that go along with it, like potential challenges like uh, postpartum mm-hmm. depression. Um, maybe I'll think of some other things here while you talk. Yeah. And I can give some, I want to share too, in case there's mothers out there, mom, expecting moms having the same issues. Um, the, the other things that I felt were extremely helpful that I learned through the first pregnancy. So being sick all the time, um, just, and it's nausea, it's, you know, just feeling nauseous all the time. Um, the C bands, so that you wear on your wrist, they hit an acupressure point. Um, I, learned about those, um, in my second pregnancy. Um, and they were amazing. They would immediately stop the nausea. Um, and I could, you know, function normally. So I highly recommend them. And I got to the point where I was like, so sensitive. I could tell when the band had shifted and moved away from that acupuncture point. So it's really great for, for morning sickness. The other thing that, um, really was a relief to me and I can talk more through it with pregnancy was the chiropractic um, care. So getting adjusted, um, while pregnant, every time I got adjusted, I just felt like this relief and they work a lot on, you know, um, positioning the baby. So that's another concern, um, with birth, safe births, like is the baby in the correct position? Has the baby moved head down? And they're, you know, women, like there's so many things to stress over when you're pregnant. Well, there's, what's the baby's position? How is the baby? And, um, chiropractic care can really help shift the baby, um, in, you know, to allow for more optimal birth. Uh, with my son, he came out great. My daughter actually was um, kind of shifted a little weird. So um, I was able to do the, the natural birth and everything, but like the, the midwife had to move my leg and stuff as she was coming out. And 
when she came out, she was not breathing. So again, something some may be, uh, you know, concerned about. And um, when, uh, so she came out and she wasn't breathing, I was holding her. And um, honestly, at that moment, I was feeling like, you know, connected. And I'm like, okay, this is now out of my hands. <laughs> like, um, I did it. I it was her pregnancy. I was in labor for like over 24 hours. And with my son, it was like five hours. So you know, complete, they say, oh, the second pregnancy should go faster than the first. And, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. But anyways, for her, it was a very long labor. So when she came out, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm done. Like I am done. Like just, I was so physically done. I just didn't have energy for anything else. And when she wasn't breathing, I was holding her, but I wasn't, honestly, I was not concerned. There was never any fear that entered my mind or anything like that. And I'm just holding her. It's almost like I picked up fear in the room, but again, I'm just holding her just happy to be done. Um, and then they put an oxygen mask on her and then they got her breathing. But with her, her head was so misshaped, um, which is how she came out and, um, breastfeeding. So there's a lot of, that can be a, a big struggle. So when I went to feed her, she ate good for the first like 12 hours and then it was very painful to nurse. So that's a sign that there's, you know, problems and why a lot of mothers, I may choose not to breastfeed is when it becomes so painful, it's like, well, you can't do it. Um, or, you know, of course it's just not working. Um, but my chiropractor who was awesome actually came to our house. It was a Saturday morning and she came over and she adjusted Vera, my daughter. Um, and then after she was, and the, by adjusting, they're not like popping the back or anything like that. Like they were doing cranial sacral, um, and they would work in her mouth too. And after she was adjusted, she ate perfectly and it was just wonderful. So that was another thing thinking back, like, man, if I didn't have that experience, like I wouldn't have been able to breastfeed my daughter um, with the positioning and everything. Like it all just lines up to help. The cranial sacral stuff is amazing. I, um, I, I heard so much about it. So I finally got a chance to, to, to try that out a couple of years ago. And, you know, being energetically, energetically sensitive, it's just, I was just amazed of how, profound uh an impact that can have with just such a it's almost like magic yep. but no it's, it's a really in-depth science you know the um up ledger he's written books about the the cranial sacral pump and how that whole mechanism works but it, it really is if uh if anybody's hasn't tried it that that's interested i would definitely recommend that Maybe switching topics because I know you're, um, but it's still related. I know you're interested in um, animal totems, and um, uh, it's interesting. I just had a cop come and back around and spin out a little bit, but it's it's raining today. So there's this animal, the stork, right? We all seen the cart cartoons with the stork. Uh, stork. If I'm saying that even right, <laughs> yeah. do you have any insights on that? Or, I mean, just in general, were there any, um, I mean, animals that had surrounded uh, the birth or any wisdom uh, from them? Yeah. Um, um, so I'm not sure that oh, I, by the uh, way, a squirrel fell out of the tree earlier on our talk. That's <laughs> uh, what Christy mentioned that, but she said it really quietly though. So. <laughs> yeah. It's been interesting. Uh, that was when I was talking about my son, which, I feel that's like my son. He's like, go hard or go home. Um, but he, okay. So the stork, you know, the stork doesn't really resonate with me much, but maybe it's thought of as like a, I don't know, a messenger. But for me, I was into, um, so elephants are really great. Motherhood totems, um, also cows. So actually in my birthing room, I have, I had a huge like two by two picture, two foot by two foot picture of a painted cow. And I had that on the wall and I put the intent like, okay, you know, I'm calling on um, cow energy to help me um, with this process. So there's some great motherhood totems out there, but I think whatever resonates with you, if you're drawn to that. Yeah. And there's just, you know, you know, you go into any like um, history museum or art place, uh, well, mainly history places. And there's just the whole fertility symbols, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be a huge yeah. thing, even with shamans and yeah, and for crops even too. Yeah. And well, you know, I guess we can start wrapping this up a little bit, right? Unless you, I, I do want to, uh, I, I alluded to this at the beginning and I want to kind of maybe turn the tables just a little bit here. Okay. And I know that Christy will be open to this because just about all my friends uh, have an open mind, even though they might not um, even be comfortable with it. They would at least hear me out and consider something. But, and, and I would say that I'm not, 
for or against this. It's just some interesting information that I've never heard before. Um, and it's from this like heavy duty, I would just say otherworldly practitioner. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and she's actually a mother too, which is even weird. And I have questions about this. You know, like I said, I'm not for or against it, but I hadn't heard before that it's almost like the perspective, and this isn't obviously not a value judgment for anybody. Um, and it's separate from our everyday lives now too. So now that I built this up and like <laughs> gave so many disclaimers, right. Um, that a fetus is almost like a, a, in a, in a way it's similar to a parasite because it can't rely on itself. It has to rely on another organism and able to grow. And I was wondering about, you know, some of all the challenges that come into that because it's not like a, yeah, it's like it's feeding off of a host, right? <laughs> I know it's so yeah. weird. It doesn't, yeah, I mean, honestly, I know. That right. resonates kids as parasites because I feel like <laughs> if I was more prepared for that, like uh, I went from, and I think that's part of women being post with postpartum mm -hmm. depression. I mean, so I'm working, you know, very successful, making, you know, 120,000 a year doing my job, feeling like, you know, I'm powerful. I'm a woman climbing the ladder, corporate ladder. And then I'm able to get so many rewards. Like I do things and I get rewarded. And then I go and have a kid. Um, and, I'm, you know, I have this bond with this kid. Like, I'm the only one who knows really what this kid needs. And I know that. And then I, it's like my whole life changes then. And I remember going back to work and it's like, yeah, I could do this. But, like, I don't want another woman watching my child. Like, I am I need to be the one. Like, I don't want to pump milk and then leave it in the fridge for someone else to feed my child. Like, you know, pumping is just, it's a whole other, like, hassle. Like, oh, I have to, like, you know then you really feel like, you know, you're just of service. Like, Oh, I'm just, you know, here's my mouth. Take it. Um, they're with children. Yes. They just, they just need so much from you. And I remember hearing, um, so they I've read like in the first six months to a year, their first chakra is really developing and their needs and their wants are the same. So for a baby, their need and their want is the same, which when you think about that, like some people say, Oh, they're so needy. Just let them cry it out or do that. But really, if you, honor that bond and their needs and wants and consider, well, it doesn't matter whatever they want or need. I'm going to give it to them. The mom is like a servant to them. And that's what is so hard for, at least for me, it was going from being in charge of my life, being able to set my own schedule to like, now I'm literally like serving <laughs> this baby around the clock. And, and I know like, yes, I can someone else go do it, but I know no one else can do it as good as me. And then I just feel guilty. And there's so much guilt that mothers feel with, oh, I'm just going to like, you know, have someone else. But, um, it, and the, our society isn't really supported as much like maternity leave here is nothing. Like in other countries, they at least give you like some countries give you like a year, which is great. But if you can't do that here, it's just, it's so hard and you're pulled in so many directions. So, you know, isn't it suggested, isn't it like the five, up to five or six that is pretty much this bond needs to be really strong, like all the time. Like, yeah, yeah. it's, you're not supposed to like start to like wean them off or be independent for that long. Right. But then after a certain point, it becomes important where you need to do that. But up until that point, it needs to be pretty much like you're saying all the time, pretty yeah. much. And I don't, I honestly, I don't know how I would do it, you know, um, especially with now they're even being, I mean, it's, it's, you know, there's pros and cons to everything to be, um, with more diversity in the workplace and giving women more power in the workplace, which I'm all for that, obviously, but the responsibility they have not only there, at the, and then if they want to consider motherhood too, it's just like, wow, you know, it's, we're talking superwoman at this point, right? Well, yeah. And it, eventually you just, you know, a woman can't do that all. Like, let's be honest. Um, there has to be, you know, give and take. And that's something that I, I don't think is honored, especially not in, in where we live now that, you know, that, um, just how important it is for the mom to be there. And there is going to be that pull. There is going to, you know, there, there's just that bond, but anyways, Oh, but with the, the five to six, and that's something mm -hmm. that I is that really right? is happy. You sent me that parenting thing okay. that mentioned that that bond stays because so my son is four, four and a half and my mother keeps saying like, Oh, you need to get him in preschool and you need to get him like, you know, out of your house and 
going out and he needs to be involved in sports and he needs to be doing all this stuff. And I still feel so like connected to him, even with like, you know, I don't know, simple things like, you know, if he has problems going to the bathroom or if he needs help in the bathroom, like, is he going to feel safe enough doing that with someone else, which we end up leaving him with a grandparent and he, and he was not safe enough. You know, he didn't feel comfortable enough and he ended up holding it the whole time. So it's just little things like that. And I know you can make children attendant at such a young age, but I was happy when I read that, that that bond can stay till five or six because then it gave me permission. I mean, my intuition was saying like, I'm not ready for this and I don't think he's ready for this. Um, but then it was just a reassurance that, okay, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not ready for it. I don't know if he's ready for it, so I'm not going to do it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, again, I can't speak from experience here, but, you know, I can just witness to my niece and nephew. And, um, yeah, they're going to have pretty much their entire lives for independence, uh, right? And now even uh, younger and younger ages of even before preschool, they, they want the kids even before preschool. And, you know, for some people that might work out, but I, I just, I see we need to support all, um, different types of, um, parenting methods too. And another one, uh, is homeschooling. I think that should be an option. I think the challenging part, uh, and it is, and the challenging part of that would just be the um, social, social interactions. Mm-hmm. That would be spending enough time to have all that scheduled, um, where that just comes with, uh, regular school. So that's one benefit of just regular yeah. typical schooling. But I see so many benefits in that because I know for me, you know, coming up, I was just the, my curiosity for wanting to learn was just beaten out of me. You know, I had to rediscover that curiosity for wanting to learn. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, but you know, like we, um, everything can be turned into an opportunity when to wrap, I kind of felt like I had a loose end with the, the, the parasite <laughs> children is parasite. I don't want to simplify it to that because it sounds a little silly, but um, you know, it's kind of off topic, but that idea originally comes into some um, really deep seers and, and clairvoyance that can have gone back into the past, ancient, ancient past and said, well, that's not, how we always used to be um, reproducing like that, according to their worldview. Like, again, like I, this is just information to me. I probably shouldn't be repeating it unless I can verify it in my own experience. Yeah. But, and for, it's a long drawn out road of how it, it changed to how it is now. But then again, I don't know. I guess I would sure. question yeah. like, is it yes. really much different? But I know, you'd have to interview a lot of moms and see like what, you know, cause there is that, you know, honestly, there is that you are giving and giving and not getting anything back. And, um, so yeah, it's, um, it's hard. <laughs> well, Christy, thanks so much for sitting down and doing this. And I, um, you know, even the, this is mostly awkward for me. I know you said you were nervous at the beginning, but it's mostly <laughs> awkward for me because this is not the typical topic I would be drawn to, but, uh, since you're so cool and your husband's so cool, I'm <laughs> glad to do this. Okay. Uh, and if I can just say any last words, sure. I, mean, I don't know if any mothers will listen to this, but I, I feel like just the biggest thing is following your intuition and, um, you know, supporting, like we mentioned, Josh mentioned, you know, having support. I feel like we all should be supportive no matter what path you choose. There's for moms, there's not an easy route and, you know, choosing to stay home with your child is, you know, has its own challenges. Um, so all of it just presents so much, so many challenges that we really just need to support each other. And, um, I think too, the other thing is just respecting the mom's intuition. If the mom says this is what she needs, then that's what she needs. Very good. Yeah. I I couldn't agree more because I mean, in this expands to all areas of life, right? Support and, and when we can help each other, especially help ourselves. So we're in a position so where we can help others. That's what it's all about for me at this point. So, all right, Christy, thank you so much.